Osiris. I can put money on it. I've lost thousands of fans talking about police brutality. I've lost even more talking about the woman's right to their bodies and their decision making. I've lost even right. more clapping back at trolls. I don't care. Hi, this is Maggie Rose. You're listening to Salute the Songbird on Osiris Media. Salute the Songbird is a platform for women in music to share their stories and let their voices be heard. And everyone has a seat at the table. Hey, everybody, it's Maggie Rose, and welcome to episode three of season two of Salute the Songbird. And I always say this because I mean it, but I'm so excited about our guest today. She's a friend of mine. She now hails from Nashville, Tennessee, but when we spoke, she was in Los Angeles, where she is originally from and where she first got her foot in the door of the music industry, working as an intern at Atlantic Records, specifically for Tori Amos. And she has made so much happen for her career, which has been incredibly exciting to watch. And I find it very fitting that I was introduced to today's guest by another badass in the industry, Miss Nada Taha, who's formerly of The Bobby Bones Show and now has her own program on Apple Music. So shout out to Nada for introducing me to today's guest, the one and only Noelle Skaggs. Noelle is the co-lead singer of the multi-platinum selling sextet Fits and the Tantrums, an incredibly awesome high-energy band, and she's a gifted, prolific songwriter who's penned some of the band's biggest hits like Out of My League and Walker. Noelle has released some of her own soulful and sultry music as a solo artist on Elektra, and was recently acclaimed as one of Billboard's top 30 female artists in the alternative song charts history, along with artists like Gwen Stefani and Lord. In addition to all of that, she's top line for hip-hop artists like the Black Eyed Peas and the Dilated Peoples. She sung background vocals for Miley Cyrus. I even think she wrote a song for the Dewey Cox movie, which is a personal favorite of mine. And she's an accomplished chef. She's traveled the world. She has her own program on Taste Made, which is a really cool app that covers a lot of content about traveling and food. It's a perfect fit for Noelle. All of these accomplishments have helped her garner the support to launch her new initiative that she wants to talk with us about today. Noelle is a person of color, and specifically in the alternative pop genre, she noticed that people like her weren't represented as much as they should be. So, she's launched a movement called Diversify the Stage, which we are all invited to join her in, and it's created to foster more accessible pipelines to careers in the music industry on and off stage for Black, Indigenous people of color and members of the LGBTQIA community, along with female identifying and non gender conforming individuals. And I love this description because on Salute the Songbird, we're trying to do the same thing. And I feel like that encapsulates really what it means to be a female figure in the industry. So let's let Noelle continue to eloquently describe this movement, tell us how we can get involved and just get to know this awesome entertainer a little bit better. Everybody, Noelle Skaggs. What's up? So good to see you. What up? Thank you so much, Maggie. It's so good to see you. You are the best, and I miss you. I feel like I would have normally seen you at this point. I know, right? This year has (laughs) dealt us all an interesting hand, and I think you've been one of the people that I think first comes to mind who's really used this year to make some change, some positive change in the world, and use your platform to do that. So where are you today? I am in Los Angeles at my apartment that I'm renting while my house is undergoing renovations in Nashville. I miss Nashville so much, but I feel like I've spoken to more people in the music scene in Nashville in this last three months than I had being in Nashville for the like last seven years outside of my friend circle. I started working on Diversify the Stage, I mean, shortly. It was bubbling up prior to George Floyd. It really hit me on Blackout Tuesday, because obviously, you know, all the protests were happening. It was a lot of social media campaigning, a lot of companies promising a lot of money towards the protection of Black lives, social justice causes, like all of the things under the sun. And I felt that following a lot of the music industry oriented posts and 
all of these things that there was a very large void of conversation as it related to the concerts industry. And me recognizing that even within my own team and my years of experience and just being in this business, that there weren't a lot of people of color that I was exposed to outside of my local community in LA. Because when I was coming up in music, it was like hip hop, soul, you know, so obviously a very diverse group of artists that I would work with on a regular basis coming up out here, the UK even. But on the backside of the business, it wasn't. It was very male dominated. It was very one demographic of ethnicity that was involved in any of the touring, the business operation side of it. I was always used to very little female leadership up until, you know, fits in the tantrums where obviously like my admin, it's a husband wife team and, oh, really? you know, it's very family oriented, but they're not people of color. My attorney is a woman. She's a beast. She's from Nashville originally not a person of color, but very on the level, right? Mm -hmm. So I've just never really had a lot of people in leadership that reflected me at all. Cross paths, maybe, but not on tour. So I really wanted to kind of open up dialogue about that. One, am I the only artist seeing this? Is it only because I'm an alternative? Like, what's the shake here, you know? Right. And then recognizing that it didn't really matter what genre of music I was in, unless it was like, you know, me with an artist, with a team of folks that they grew up with in their neighborhood, you know, mm -hmm. or if I'm playing a gig in, say, Riverside, California, it's very Latinx community, Hispanic community dominated. So it's a very different look from the front of house to the back of house. So it just really depends on where I was. So I just wanted to have conversations with people that actually hire folks. You know, it's like I started calling tour managers and they started introducing me to PAs and they started introducing me to the vendor suppliers, you know, because I had so many questions. And within this process, recognize that as an artist, I was so disconnected from all of that. We show up, we do our job. Unless you are our day-to-day -day manager, if you have one, tour manager, production manager, wardrobe stylist, like your monitor engineer or whoever's handling your front of house, like how often are we connected to the other folks whose jobs we have no idea what they do, have no understanding. I just learned what a rigger does. You know, I had no idea. What does a rigger do? A rigger actually is a part of hanging the lights. They're the ones that get on these automated stages and they hang your lighting and they, they like rig all of the things and you have to be certified for this kind of gig. And it is a very lucrative and viable career path. You could go out and get your electrician's license right now and be working. So, you know, I was learning about all of these different roles, like who really does what, like, how do the promoters work? Who's actually contracting these vendors? I started, I just basically went to school for back of house. And in that process, I learned that it was very common for this issue that we are seeing with lack of diversity on our stage crews, people trying to wrap their heads around why a big Thing with not being able to find communities of color who are interested in this area or not knowledgeable of the roles and career paths available in this space. So I really buckled down and I said, there's two questions we have to ask ourselves. Is there a centralized form for finding staff? Does it exist? Why isn't it being used if it is? If it isn't, can we start building that? Can we just build a massive centralized database that is familiar for folks that are either recommending on the agent side, tour managers, whatever, to their clients, tour managers hiring staff and teams and stuff for what makes up our show crews, how vendors are contracted, the whole thing. Can we create that? And in that process of me asking that question, I was introduced to someone that started something for the very idea of connecting people that are looking for work 
to be able to be directly connected with recruiters. The website is called neverfamous.com. It was started by a tour manager named Jerome Crooks, who is the tour manager for Nine Inch Nails. Mm -hmm. He, like me, has come from the alternative space. His first gig in production was at Warp Tour. Kevin Lyman gave him his first job. You know, so been in the game for a long time. He's seen all of it. He's had all of his different experiences of people not believing that he's the tour manager when he walks off the bus because they're used to seeing somebody that isn't reflective of an African-American person being in leadership. Mm. And, you know, he's also very much about education and bringing up young people in the right way into this space, being trained, creating safe spaces, honoring and supporting your staff and crews, you know, looking out for their health and their mental health and well-being, because it's not easy for us to be off the road. You know, even as artists, we understand what that's like. So we were saying, well, if the pool is shallow, let's create something that will introduce people through the space and talk about the things that happen behind the scenes, all the folks that are responsible for the productions that we're able to do in such a wonderful way and entertaining way for our fans, you know. So I started making phone calls to the Recording Academy first tried to figure out what they had going on. And as I was still kind of like formulating the idea of what it was I needed to actually engage in, because who needs to like repeat the will, right? So I ended up calling Music Forward Foundation or being connected to their head of marketing. Music Forward Foundation is a grassroots organization that has very much the same trajectory of creating more diverse workforces in the music industry. And introducing, you know, I think it's, they start at middle school. I think it's like middle school to college age youth and introducing them to careers in the music industry through shadowing opportunities, through educational panels and masterclass discussions and things like that. So we started working together and we decided to launch what became the Diversify the Stage youth program, next generation education program or career exploration program in partnership with them. And I pulled in some other grassroots organizations because we wanted to focus on women of color. The massive thing I had noticed is there weren't a lot of women of color that I was being introduced to that were in leadership roles. So we decided to do a program. The program starts with masterclass discussions with professionals in the industry on the live side. So concerts, events, touring mentorship with the same type of leadership across all of it. So agencies, promoters, anybody can be involved that has a career in this space. And then internship and apprenticeship placement. Internship is more on the, you know, agent, promoter, back inside that more business, that tour marketing department at your record label, the whole thing. The apprenticeship is a more extended stretch on the road. So within the concerts industry, Say you as Maggie Rose, you can create a PA opportunity for someone that is interested in either becoming an audio technician, you know, that is actually studying sound. They understand the lingo. They have some theater background. This is more for the like slightly more experienced, has had a few internships. That's what we're looking at as far as experience level. But it's this entry point as a PA for someone in your camp. And it could be if you're doing like a promo run, we tend to run on on slimmer teams then, right? There's an opportunity for the label to send out one of these, you know, kind of PAs for your promo opportunity. And they can shadow your production coordinator, manager, tour manager, and just be a part of the hands-on experience. So that's one of the unique things that we're trying to do. That's amazing. Thank you. And then the other part of it is the already existing programs that are happening, right? So these grassroots educational programs that have like, you know, semester programs, there's organizations like Well Done, which is a mentoring program. They also do internship placement, looking at say C3, their internship things for their events, anything that's connected to C3 events, AG does stuff like that. So really connecting with the promoters. Also looking at our suppliers, suppliers have a lot of training programs because you have to learn how to use their gear and they are often staffing for us as well. 
So it's like helping diversify their pool of candidates by teaming up with an organization like mine and pushing those kids into those opportunities and having them pay for. We're really looking at equitable opportunities because if you don't see that you can actually make a living doing something nine times out of 10, you're not going to go for it, you know, unless you're just going to be an artist, right? Or you're right. going to like really go after your creative passion. So that's really what I'm doing on on that side. It's, it's like helping out the existing members of the community that are veterans that are have been working in the trenches with us and expanding their opportunity to get in front of recruiters and for people to be able to find them. And with the intention of creating diverse teams and staff and have it reflect what we're seeing in the front of house and then bringing in the next generation of folks and really supporting them in the right way. I want to talk about this amazing career that you've had, which has allowed you to launch this initiative. You've been doing this for so long, and you talked about getting your sea legs and your muscles working. Noelle, on stage, yeah. I don't think you ever lost your sea legs, and we all know that you got the muscles to put the shows <laughs> together, but it really is remarkable. You talk about how you started top lining for a lot of hip-hop artists you were working with dilated mm -hmm. peoples and black eyed peas and just some insane artists who were more in that community. And did you perhaps notice a shift when you moved into the alt pop world or is it just something that was catalyzed by recent events? And I mean, you've been all over the world. You've met so many different people. You've yeah. toured in every country essentially. So I guess this is a compound yeah. question when you noticed it and it started to really bother you and you had to speak to it, did you feel any of those comments coming your way of the whole shut up and sing? And this is not something, don't rock the boat. No, and yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because, you know, as I started building this and having to think about my experience so that I could speak from a place of like personal experience and this is my personal mm -hmm. goal, right? I'm doing this as much for me as I am doing it for other people who look like me, that share my experience, that share my gender identity, that share, that have in some ways been left out of the conversation, been dismissed, been gaslighted mm -hmm. on a number right. of occasions. I recognize that I experienced more of that than I think I allowed myself to see at the time. I'm very much my mother's daughter in that I let things roll mm -hmm. off of me, especially if it's people that I know I'm never going to see again. Right. You know, I have a tendency to just be like, whatever, I'm never, that person is not in my life. But then to think about and consider that that person is crossing paths with so many other artists like me uh -huh. and they're doing the exact same thing to them mm -hmm. that they did to me in the room. Right. So looking at it from that viewpoint, I don't want that yeah. to happen to anybody. I don't want that to be the norm. I don't want to have anybody that is a young artist like myself walking into a room and seeing basically just testosterone yeah. everywhere. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, being literally the only person of color in that space. Right. And having to deal with code switching or being worried about how they speak or, you know, I don't want any of anybody to go through that. Right. If you clap back, then maybe you can stop this behavior there instead of allowing it to yeah. continue. Cause, yeah. And I think you've yeah. alluded sometimes to even well-meaning members of your own team insulating you from some of these comments that were directed at you. And oh, a thousand percent. I think that that takes away from you the opportunity to say, no, I refuse to allow you to speak to me or of me like that and nip it in the bud. I mean, how do you yeah. deal with just the balance of being an artist who is fully themselves and offers that all up on the plate, but then being the way that you are, which is wanting to face that kind of rhetoric head on? 
not wanting to, yeah. but but choosing to, so that you can, yeah, swat it. Choosing to, yeah, choosing to. Well, that's the thing, right? It's the choice. Mm-hmm. I pick my battles. There are some instances, like just even looking at social media, because you know everybody on social media thinks that they can just talk to anybody right. the way that they want. Say to. that to me in this you room, know, especially if they're a fan. As fans, when you're really invested in someone mm-hmm. as a fan. You have a perception of, and it's as unconscious as I'm going to state it, you have a perception of how that person should be, how they should act, what they should and shouldn't do. And your opinion is above any thought that they could have about themselves. So you changed your hair color. I don't think you should have done that. I don't think she looks good (laughs) doing that. Why did she do that? I know. It still hurts our feelings. And, And I bring that up, you know, exactly, right? Because there is a disassociation with humanity when you're watching somebody on a screen than when you are in front of them and you get to feel their energy, you get to be around their person. So you have a very different imagination about who this person is based upon watching them on TV, on a video, on an inanimate Mm. object that has given you the idea that this person is X, Y, and Z. And that is your dream. So the moment that they change that dream, you either respond negatively or positively. But there is always some ownership and your opinion about them, which is why I think a lot of artists shy away from being politically active on their social media, like speaking up about things because they're worried about upsetting that balance. You know how many fans I've lost? I'm sure I can put money on it. I've lost thousands of fans just in the last year alone about talking about police brutality. Yeah. I've lost even more talking about the woman's right to their bodies and their decision making. I've lost even more clapping back at trolls. Mm -hmm. I don't care. Yeah. By being fully yourself, which is what you would hope would be the attraction. Yeah, and I may not be as popular as you know, some other artists that are in my position because of that. And I feel like I stopped allowing others to dictate my feelings, to dictate how I moved in my career a long time ago because it wasn't serving me. It wasn't serving me to act according to the outside world. It's not sustainable. Yeah, it's not sustainable. It was going terribly wrong for my mental health. Just me constantly being worried about X, Y, and Z. Am I doing this right? Am I speaking right? It started to affect my speaking voice. I developed a tremor. Whoa. You know, my publicist started to know it. She's like, what is going on with your voice? Because it would fluctuate. It would be like the volume would just all of a sudden, it was completely uncontrollable. Started showing up in my singing voice. And it was from the stress. Literally of living my life so involved in the outside and making everybody else happy and nurturing everybody else that I stopped nurturing myself. So my body started to respond in a way that I had to pay attention to what I was doing for me. Yes. Right? Yeah. I'm a fan of now just not giving a rat's ass, you know, I'll be very respectful, but like- Well, I think that that's wisdom that comes with having done this as long as you have. What is the work you're doing with Taste Made? Taste Made has been a wonderful um, plat, you know, platform and supporter of my stuff with Adventures with Skags, which primarily focuses on food and travel. Mm-hmm. I love Taste Made. I'm a subscriber. Yeah, they've given me some wonderful opportunities with hosting uh, one-off series for them. I've done a couple of series with them. And we were actually in talks about another series that I wanted to push in Nashville right before COVID hit. So I'm hoping that we continue those conversations, but it's all a part of the grand scheme for Adventures with Skags, which is, you know, kind of focusing on the development of my own travel and food related series and really giving more opportunities to storytellers who look like me, people who travel that are, you know, a part of the BIPOC community and giving them that space to share their experiences and 
You There's got some always skills. an element. You can throw down in the kitchen <laughs> for sure. Thank I've you. seen some of your clips and you certainly know how to travel. You're a professional touring musician. <laughs> and I think you guys have been everywhere. And this tour that you have coming up looks insane. Uh, yeah, I it's going to be great. All of your fits in the tantrums, your records are so fun and high energy. But I think my favorite record is what you guys did at Metro in Chicago, that live record, oh, Top yeah. to Bottom. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, you as a commander on stage, it's so apparent when you listen to that audio, you're just riling up the crowd. And I think it's really cool that you guys have your studio versions of your music yeah. available. But that one definitely got me moving. I would encourage people to check that out. And it just got me excited for when you hit the road again. But you also, you guys have had some incredible success with just film and TV placements with your music mm -hmm. that I think is a really cool cross section of music that you've been able to be successful in. And I know that that's probably been a bit of a lifesaver yeah. during COVID. Yeah. Is it, yeah. When you're writing, how is it that you have seemed to just capture lightning in a bottle so many times again and again? Because it's, I mean, these are big placements. <laughs> it's kudos to Fitz, really, because when he started his career, he was doing jingles. Oh, really? OK, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So like Bratz Dolls, I think, was one of his clients pedigree. He'd done all kinds of things, but that was how he made money. You know, yeah. in the in the early stages of his career, he you know he started in film school, and then he dropped out to become a music major, or not dropped. Yeah, he dropped out of that major to study music, and he started interning or you know kind of intern engineer for a guy that later became his business partner, Mickey Petralia, who was just doing a ton of like jingle and sync songs, sync work. Mm -hmm. So he really understands how to craft the sound of something to give it that kind of commercial taste, you know, but it's there's just, some soulful lyrics. In yeah, your music. absolutely. I think, yeah, both of us between, you know, myself and him, we kind of serve that a lot of the commercials really kind of look at that. Like mm -hmm. they want that pocket. They want to, cause you know, it fuels more of a diverse atmosphere of consumers, you know? Right. So they really have that down to a science and, and what they look at. So, yeah, we've been very fortunate there. It's always fun. You know, it's yeah. always fun. These records are not easy. I think, no. you know, as we've grown as artists, it's become harder to write these records than it did when we first started. There's a different thought that happens, obviously, when you become older. You think about things differently. You think about the messaging a lot differently how you want to execute so that mm -hmm. it's age appropriate for where you are in your life. I definitely feel for me, the last two records have been the hardest records to really wrap our heads around. And we're all kind of doing different things in the process. Like, you know, I released Great For You. Oh, does anybody out there know how to love another torture show? You're no good for me, you're no good for me, but I'd be great for you. I just wanted to get back to like just writing with friends and like mm -hmm. just not thinking about fits in the tantrums and, and just writing something. And it just so happens that, you know, the label loved it and we put it out and I'll maybe do more stuff like that, you know? Well, um, I think you living in Nashville, we have to write one together at some point. Oh, I would love that. And Nashville will do that to you too, right? It just, it's yeah. such a songwriting town by proxy or like all these resources and people, that community, as you know, is yeah really welcoming and, and connected and everyone knows each other who's worked on different projects where sometimes yeah. I don't always run into that in LA. I'm like, but you guys worked on the same album and you don't know each other. Yeah, and yeah. You guys have yeah. a, that camaraderie between your band, it seems very evident. I mean, we've been together for 13 years, so I hope so. You get to a point where you're in a band for so long, like, you talk or you don't. <laughs> it doesn't right. matter. And, like, you get you get together and it's like you didn't skip a beat. It's like being in the room with, totally. you know, your best friend or your sister, you know? So that's kind of, we'll see what happens. We're just, 
you know, gearing up again for shows. We got our starting show is here in Ventura. We're doing another drive-in show on the 20th oh, cool. it's for Sign Mi- Sound Mind Fest. And it's us and All Time Low co-headlining. Awesome. And that would be fun. I think it's more of an acoustic thing, though. I'm very confused about it, to be honest with you. Like, are we doing an acoustic show or is it like a show show? <laughs> Everyone who's reemerging right now just feels like yeah. a little yeah. confused. And I think once we get through our first stretch of shows, we'll be like, okay, all right, I remember how to do this. And this I'm, is what it I'm looks like. I'm still trying and- to figure out if I'm supposed to actually be there. Um, <laughs> I'm like, am I actually performing? <laughs> Well, since you're the co-lead singer, I would assume yeah. the answer is yeah. yes. <laughs> I, don't, I think people would be pretty pissed if you weren't there. Right. <laughs> Your fans might uh, might be disappointed. Yeah. Hey, everybody. It's Maggie, and I hope you're enjoying my conversation with Noelle, whom I've always admired for her musical career. But this new venture that she's embarking on is really gutsy and inspiring. And it's seemingly political, but it's really not. It's about inclusivity and driving home that old adage of if you see it, you can be it. And we've talked a lot about that on this show, specifically as it pertains to a career as an artist. But she's pointing to so many opportunities that are in the music industry that keep this touring industry going. And I wonder if as you hear it, you can see yourself pursuing a career in the music industry or see someone else. And furthermore, if we can't apply the whole sentiment behind this movement to all the fields in our life, where are there untapped resources that can make the work we're doing a little bit better? So let's not let it end with us. Do what you can. Go to diversifythestage.org and see how you can help and also see how you can diversify the stage of your own life. Let's get back to Noel. Noel, I I love you. I could talk to you all day. I want to finish with a question that I feel like diversify the stage. The way you describe the movement is really eloquently put and I'm trying to show the scope of what a woman in the industry looks like. And sometimes that doesn't mean the emphasis is on gender. It's mm-hmm. what you said. It's different genres, different ages, different levels of establishment. Black, Indigenous, people of color, people from the LGBTQ community, people who identify as females or people who are non-gender conforming. How you put that, I think, is a really astute way to frame it because there is such a wealth of that to be amplified and our list for potential guests on this series is continuously growing. But I still like to ask the question... Because I think we focus so much on why being a woman in this industry is hard and mm-hmm. you know some of the struggles that we face that we have to overcome. But I think that there are advantages and I'd like to hear oh, yeah. what you think some of those are. I think when we unify, we are an unstoppable force. There is no one that will dismiss us and they haven't, you know. I definitely want to give, you know, shouts to the grassroots organizers that are literally women led. You know, when we think about women in music, just headed up by Nicole Barcelona, was the new president. That is a very woman forward. I'm talking to her tomorrow. And yeah, she's fantastic. Fantastic human being. She loves you. She's great. I love her right back. You know, we have Ebony, a gen- uh, gender amplified who I'd actually met because she heads up Atlantic's recording studio. Like she is, runs it. Mm-hmm. And she created Gender Amplified to really support young women who are looking to step into careers as engineers and creating opportunities for them there. Michelle Arkuski, she is the music. Then Carrie yes. Kays, who is Sound Girls. Nancy Tarr who is well done. These are all incredible women. Mm -hmm. Leslie Fram, Reese Palmer. Leslie Olnick over at Live Nation. She's incredible as well. Sam Kirby Yo, who is now co-head of UTA. Allie Harnell at Live Nation. You know, there's some beasts. You know, we got a lot of incredible women 
quite a group. And they're all very, very, very much about pushing the needle forward and and making space for everybody. Yeah. I think it's a beautiful thing to see everyone linking arms and just the visual of that alone, I think, yeah, speaks volumes and encourages others to join in. Yeah. Something to think about for all of us as women, we can often get in our own way. I think anybody within this space of really trying to work towards a big change effort, remembering that we are all working towards the same goals and we can get there faster if we really connect and pull our resources. That is something that I really wanted to make sure that I was pushing myself to make sure happened because I can't do everything. You know, Mm -hmm. my extent of knowledge in this education space when dealing with young people and all of this thing is very limited. I rely upon the support from these organizers that have been doing it for a long time to help me and to, you know, mentor me, you know, towards the best practice and how to navigate even with what I'm contributing. So it's a matter of really looking at our small grassroots organizations and how we can help each other where their strength is, where their obstacle is, where you can help in that obstacle. You know, we decided to team up on this DTS program because I had a conversation with Carrie, okay, is it Sound Girls? And she was like, we often run out of mentors. We have more students than we have mentors participating, you know, or vice versa, right? So I was like, well, we can't let that happen. Let's just go ahead and and collaborate. And then these instances, if I don't have somebody in my database, I would love to be able to tap you to help me find the right person for this cohort member, Mm -hmm. you know, and it worked. Happened again recently, just got somebody hired at C3. Nobody in my cohort fit the role. I did an outreach to Well Done and to Live Out Live. Live Out Live sent me things. I was like, I pared them down, sent them into C3. They hit me back did the interviews, hired the person from Live Out Life. Awesome. So we were able to make sure, one, that we got diverse applicant pool, gave C3 the opportunity to interview and do the whole thing, but we did it in this collaborative manner. And I'm not afraid to do that. I'm not afraid. I'm like, if it doesn't fit my cohort, why would I just pass on it? Why not pass it on or share it? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because we're only doing better. A little extra follow through. Yeah, right. We're creating more access for more people if we are working together in this collaborative and coordinated manner. Like there's nothing that can stop us, you know, Mm -hmm. because eventually if you keep recreating the will, you're chasing after the same money. You're chasing after the same schools. You're doing X, Y and Z. And we're still in the same place that we started. Right. Because you can only do so much. I'm really looking forward to seeing all of the stuff that I've been doing this year, how it manifests into people actually working together, even after I go back on tour, you know? Yeah. A little altruism from everybody. Don't allow yourself to be the dead end for some of these opportunities, just because it might not be the perfect fit for that specific example. Exactly. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I love you. I think you're the best. Thank you. I, I, I can't you wait too. to see you back in Nashville. And I'm really excited to see you and Fits in the Tantrums out on the road. I think that's going to be I'm awesome. I'm excited. Congratulations yeah. to you. your tour and Thank you. getting back out there. Thank you so much, Maggie. You're always killing it. I love it. Thank you so much for listening. And make sure to keep up with Noelle on her socials at Noelle Skaggs. And give Fits in the Tantrums a follow as well. They just listed a ton of tour dates that they have this summer coming up. And some of them even have my friend Brie Kennedy opening. Their show is awesome and very high energy. And most importantly, go check out how you can get involved with Diversify the Stage by looking at their website, diversifythestage.org. They've made it super easy for you to jump in and be a part of this movement. And to keep up with me, my music, and my touring calendar, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at I am Maggie Rose. This week, we're starting our 60-date tour in Annapolis. So I have a ton of dates out there on my website, Maggie Rose Music, and I really hope to see you guys out there. My album is coming out on August 20th, and we'll be supporting all of that new music on the tour this summer. 
You can find me on With The Band as well, where you can get exclusive Sleuth the Songbird content along with new music, live stream concerts, and more. You've been listening to Salute the Songbird on Osiris Media. The executive producers are Kirsten Cluthy and Brad Stratton from Osiris Media and Austin Marshall. And the show is edited and mixed by Brad Stratton. Original music by Maggie Rose. Please subscribe to Salute the Songbird on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast content. And if you like the show, recommend it to a friend or leave us a review so that others can join the conversation. Thanks for listening. And to close out the show, here's Hand Clap by Fitz and the Tantrums. Yes.